who's Lee Priestley. Good afternoon. Right, I've just been sat outside working out how I'm going to fit a 40 minute presentation in 20 minutes, but we'll do it first. Um, I'm being filmed, so I'm not going to be able to tell you too much about what I think is going to be happening going forward, because that's breaking the rules. Um, my name is Lee Priestley, I'm head of power origination at Centrica uh, at Energy. Um, I've been with Centrica now 16 miserable years, um, and uh, I joined 1998 as an accountant. Um, I used to work in the jigsaw manufacturing industry, so you can see the synergies there. Um, I became a power trader in 2001, so I worked for what was called Energy at the time, uh, when UK power became a traded commodity. Uh, in 2003, I became our senior power trader, and in 2007, I was head of UK power and coal trading. Um, it, coal trading was great, but I was too old to do it. Uh, so in 2011, I moved over to origination, which is much more sedate career, which I'm pleased to say I'm enjoying uh, to this day. Um, right. Uh, I thought it might be useful just to give you a quick overview um, of where Centrica Energy fits into the into the overall Centrica Group. Obviously, you work British Gas today, which is our in our international downstream business. I work in our international <coughs> upstream business, uh, and Centrica Energy is based in Windsor and is effectively our trading and uh, origination function. Um, so all of our traders and our 24/7 shift teams sit in Windsor, and all of the originators work out of Windsor. And our job is to essentially is to give a route to the wholesale market to either the downstream business, the customer business, or to our upstream business, which is our gas fields and power stations, and try and make money trading energy. So, um, so my brief was to come and to give you uh, a little bit of an idea about what's been going on uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the markets over the last sort of 18 months to two, uh, to two years. Um, so this, this is the biggest screen I've ever seen, by the way. I've seen it, I guess I can point at it. Um, so this is what's been happening to the, the, the gas. This is the day ahead gas price uh, over the last eight, say 18 months to two years. So um, let's just, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we haven't got very long. But just to give you some flavour of what's, what, what the trends have been. So I think the most striking bit, but so just, just be guide, this is the, um, the gas price, okay, uh, in pence per therm, and, and this is time at the, at the bottom. And the black line here is the day ahead gas price. So you can see, obviously, the, the most interesting bit is this massive spike that you've, that you've got at the top, um, which was effectively caused, um, was effectively caused by Sort of some prolonged, uh, some extremely cold weather, some, some dips in supply from Norway, uh, and, um, and also uh, some sort of geopolitical tensions in, in the world as well. So effectively what you see is the gas price there is just ramping up um, over this very cold period, which I think was the coldest March since 1962, apparently. I wouldn't know, um, it wasn't here um, Not by much, but... Uh, so, and then since then, obviously prices have collapsed here as we come into the summer period, obviously it's a lot, it's a lot warmer. And then we have a very, very stable summer uh, through to about here. And then what we see here is the prelude to what happened here. So, uh, in last winter, it was a very, very, very mild winter, I don't know if you remember. Um, we, we did not use all or, or anywhere near all of the gas that was in, in the UK storage. So, we had a very, very mild winter, so prices cratered when we got through into Q1 because there was loads and loads of gas installed. The system was very, very comfortable. There were no supply shocks. There was nothing going on. And the price continues to crater as you get down into the summer. And the reason for that is because normally what you expect is all of the gas storage empties over the winter, and then people use the summer to then inject. So they buy and inject. So there's lots and lots and lots um, of buying in the summer. There was none of that this year, and the price just went through the bottom. If you see here, the price went down as low as sort of 35 pence per burn, which is just unheard of, really. Um, and then, as we come back into the winter, prices start going up because things are starting to get a bit, to get a bit cold. So, when we start this graph, we start the, gra the graph here in January 2013, we're at 62 pence per burn. We have a high of 105. And then on the 1st of October, we are good line, around about 50 pence per thumb. For a packet of wine gums, can anybody tell me what the day ahead price for today, for today was when it was trading yesterday? In pence per thumb, come on. 
they're fresh. I've just got them out of the vending machine. 58. <laughs> Sorry? 58. No. Anyone else? 88. 88? It's not that cold. 62. Uh, 62. 65. 35. I'm going to go 58. It was 52. Well done. I can't throw these anymore because of health and safety. There's plenty more loads, so don't worry. Right. So that is gas. This is power. This is my specialty, apparently. Um, and if you can see, if you look at the graph now, we've got a red line uh, and a black line. Uh, the red line being power and the black line being gas. The only thing that you can deduct from this, this graph is that the correlation between UK power and UK gas is, 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 is pretty good. Okay? And the reason for that is that about 40% of the generation, UK generation, is, is gas fired. So it's a bit of power tends to follow gas. Gas is a very liquid market, power isn't. So power is looking, looking for things to follow. It's all the same, all the same reasons that you've got here. So uh, high gas prices, very, very cold, um, and it's following exactly the same shape. Okay, and then when you get down to here, um, things sort of start to diverge a little bit, and that's, that's sort of for me. That's where that's the uh, that's the interesting bit. What's happened here? Gas prices have got so low um, uh, that, um, that a lot of the coal-fired power stations. What happens is the power price has been dragged down with the gas. Okay. To a point where anybody who's running on coal, it's no longer economic for them to run. Okay, um, so let me just show you that. Let's see some. Right. Dark spreads and spark spreads. Okay, the black line is the dark spread, which is the spread between the price of power and the price of coal, and the and the whatever colour that is, some kind of pinky colour at the bottom. Um, is the spark spread, which is the spread between um, power and gas. Um, and, the, and the spread, so effectively what the spread is saying is it's saying, like, if I buy some coal and I put it in my coal fired power station and I sell power at the price in the market, I'm going to be making £20 a megawatt hour. If I, in this situation, if I buy gas in the market and I turn it into electricity, I'm actually going to be making a loss. So I'm not going to make it, I'm going to turn my power station off. Okay? So what, what, what that graph showed on the, on the previous graph in this, where the, the power price started to get supported, was because as the gas price fell, it dragged down the price of power, which is dragging this dark spread down. You can see it coming down, 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 to the point where it's no longer economic for them to run. So they will turn off. As they turn off, the power market tightens. The price of power starts to go up in, in relation to gas. And the spark spread, as you can see, it starts to go positive again. So effectively what we've got happening there is we've got um, coal, we call coal, uh, coal to gas switching. Can anybody tell me what the um, spread is for a biomass power station that runs on wood chip? There's no sweets for that. It's bark spread, it's rubbish, sorry about that. Um, so that's what's happening here. Power price is being supported. Um, the only other thing to point out on here is um, Often people say, well, how much impact is wind generation having on, um, having on power price in the UK? Uh, the last two bubbles here talk about uh, lower than expected wind in this one and the price going up. Uh, and here we're talking about lower than wind and the price going up. The interesting thing to say about that is wind on its own can't really have that effect. But what we're seeing here at the back end, as the power system starts to get tighter and the margins get thinner, because obviously some of the cold kit is coming off, as you may have read in, in the press, as the margins get tighter, obviously wind has more and more because it's must run generation or it's not run generation. Um, so it can't affect power price on its own, but in, 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 sort of in, in unison with maybe nukes <coughs> coming off or with, with really cold weather, it can have an effect when the system gets tight. <coughs> so, we were here, I'm going to use these as an incentive. So we started at £41 a megawatt hour. We went to 75 pounds a megawatt hour, and on the 1st of November now, we are at 52 pounds a megawatt hour. So the pro anyone tell me what the price today, when it was trading yesterday, was? 48. 48. 48. Let's say about three bids. Oh, work with me, I'm being filmed. Maybe don't <laughs> 55. 55 and? 62. No, who, who said 40s? 48. 48. Well done, sir. It was 42. 10 pounds lower. Because well, it's a lot milder now than it was then. Right. Looking forward. 
what is going on. Now, in, in, what we've got here uh, is the, um, the, the forward-looking price. So we've got the uh, current price of uh, the winter that we're in. So uh, winter runs from October through to March. Then we've got next summer, so April through to uh, September. And then we've got winter 15, and then we've got summer, and then we've got winter 15. So obviously you're expecting the summer prices to be a lot lower than the winter ones, which you'd expect. Uh, and we've also got a situation here that they call it the market. This market is in contango. So the near, the near price periods are cheaper than the far out period. So for the winter, the curve is going that way, and for the summer, the curve is going that way. So it's slightly up. So it's in contango. The only way I can remember in contango, which means it's going up instead of going out, is because it's going the other way. It's called backwardation. That's an easier one to remember. Okay. Um, what is driving those prices and why is it more expensive at the back than it is at the front? Well, we've said that it's, it's been really, really mild and we've got plenty of, plenty of gas in store, which is why the prices at the front are so much lower. People aren't expecting that situation to happen again, okay? Um, so if you think about it, January and February, which are, which are historically <coughs> the two uh, cheapest, the two cheapest, sorry, two most expensive winter months, trading around 55p at the moment, it's come down a bit now. Uh, whereas this front winter is, is way over 60, where it was when this was done. I can't tell you what it is now because there's another question coming up. Um, so I think what this is telling you is that gas prices further out, people aren't pricing in the fact that we've had this drop because of all the storage that we've got and the mild weather. They are expecting storage to deplete this winter. We are expecting to have, we are expecting to have more seasonal winters, <coughs> which will mean we don't have so much gas going into the summer, which means next summer and next winter will be higher. Okay. What drives, what drives these prices? Well, gas in the UK is uh, still um, a very, very uh, dependent on how much is being produced in the UK continental shelf itself, how much is being produced and uh, delivered down pipelines from Norway, um, how much gas we've got in store, as we've said already, and then uh, how much LNG we can expect on, on any particular day. Any one of those levers could see the price go up or the cost go down. So, can anybody tell me, and let's get a bit monotonous now, there's only two more packets of sweets, so, so don't, just bear with me. Right. Uh, yesterday, winter 15, which is this winter, yeah, can anybody tell me what that was trading at yesterday in pence per thumb? <coughs> Come on. 60. Okay, it's your turn to be a trader. Come on. Anyone got a better bid than 60 or a, or a lower bid? So 54. 59, well done. 59 pence a third. It's cheap. Cheapest chips, apparently. Power. Okay, power. Uh, power's an interesting one. Of course it is. It's my, it's my area. Um, similar situation going on in power in the sense, not, not quite so pronounced, but we've got much lower prices at the front uh, than we've got further out. Uh, the market, again, is in a sort of, I would say, medium contango. Um, and uh, which means the answer is more expensive further out than it is in the internal. Different sets of drivers. Obviously, gas is a driver. We've talked about the correlation between power and gas, but in power, uh, the drivers uh, are slightly different in the sense that um, we all know that uh, in March 2015 we're expecting um, more closures, so more coal plant coming off, uh, and and also next summer we see the carbon tax go from around about nine pounds fifty per ton right the way up to 18, 18 pounds a ton, and that is feeding through uh, into the into the power price going forward. Those two bullish factors, i.e. those factors which are looking like they're going to push the price, the price up, are somewhat dampened as you go further out into sort of 2017, 18, or certainly 18, because of the expected uh, implementation of the capacity mechanism, whereby the government will tender uh, so the power stations can be paid a premium to sit there and come on in times of stress. Now, if they're being paid a subsidy by the government, they don't need to see that price in the power price in order to come on. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if you're going to send your power for £50 in order for you to come on and generate because it means you're going to make money, if the government's giving you 10 you could then sell at 40 and you're still getting your £50. So that will have a, that will have a bearish impact, on, on, certainly on the wholesale market, but obviously that will be seen, that, that, obviously that cost of that, that, that scheme will filter its way through into, into building differently. So, can anybody tell me what the price of winter 15 was yesterday traded? Come on, it's the last it's the last one. I'll start the bidding at 51. It's between 51 and 55. 
Three guesses, come on. Three, two, two. Fifty-four. Fifty-two. I'm going to buy better sweets next time. The enthusiasm there is underwhelming. I appreciate I own the lunchtime slot. Right. So this is uh, this is the changing shape of the uh, UK power market. So um, what we're saying here uh, is that, um, and this is. It's, it's some of this is some of the nearer term stuff is fact and is known about. Some of the further end stuff is, is what we think at the moment, but may or may not happen. So don't take that as red. So what we're seeing here, I think what the general trend is, as you can see, as I said, there's a lot more power plants coming off than there is coming on. Because there's old, uh, a coal fired power stations that have been run, that haven't fitted their FGD in 2008, which <coughs> closed by 2015. Um, there is uh, Wilfa, the old nuclear power station coming off. Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's some CCGTs, the older CCGTs <coughs> also being mothballed as well, given the fact that the spark spreads are so low. Um, and there's very little new generation, there's very little new generation coming on. This big slug of biomass that you see here is actually dragged and um, is actually dragged in Edinburgh, possibly uh, switching from coal to biomass. It's not new, it's, it's old. Um, the interesting thing about this, I think, for me, is that you know, we're saying in the back here that we're going to see more interconnected into the UK as a result of the higher carbon tax. That may or may not happen. Um, and also, you know, just to point out that if you put on, I mean, this looks like what about eight or nine hundred megawatts of wind there coming on, but we're losing two point two gigawatts of coal here and another gigawatt of coal here. A gigawatt of coal will generate you a gigawatt of electricity. Nine hundred megawatts of wind because it's intermittent and generate you on average 300 megawatts. So for every megawatt of wind you install, you actually only get a third of a megawatt. So the balance of the system, the system will get tighter. Which I think it's all about to 10 million. And just before we break for questions, um, just to show you what that means in terms of the stack. So each one of these is showing you the marginal cost of generation and how that builds up into a stack at different levels of demand. So effectively, you've got wind generation, which is fuels free. You've got nuclear, which runs at about eight pound a megawatt once the cost source is up and running. You've got your interconnectors, which want to build or just flip whichever way the, the price signal tells you. We've got coal here, which is in 2014, which, as we said, is fairly cheap <coughs> and showing you good spreads. And then we go into the gas stack, uh, and then we're up into the pump storage, and once you're up into pump storage and, 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 and low efficient gas then you're really looking at much higher prices before these, and these plants can dispatch. The difference between this now and that then is that the, the gas kicks in a lot earlier because there's less coal. Okay? So you should expect to see slightly higher prices, which is why the market's in container. That's it. <coughs> My only question slide is gone. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? Do, do you have customers who are buying energy on the, on the day you have market? Or you do that and you have different type of contracts with your customers? We don't see, I don't, we, we, do, have, we do have contracts, don't we, where people can buy down to day, <coughs> we haven't got anybody on them. Yeah. Um, uh, from a supply side, yeah. from a generation side, we do, we do a lot of power purchase agreements on renewable assets, and we'll sign an agreement with a wind farm or a biomass plant or something to buy all the power that they generate. And a lot of those guys, their funding will be based on them getting day ahead. So those PPA, the, the price you offer, is it fixed or variable? Variable. So we'll, we'll offer a variable price. We don't, no, we, we, I don't want to fix the price. If I've got a customer in the side who wants to buy fixed price power, I'm not going to buy fixed price power myself. Not for 15 years because I can only, the market only trades out three years, so I can't hedge it. So what we tend to do is we say, what the, what the funders will, if a fund, if someone wants to build a wind farm, they go to the bank, and the bank will say, well, I'll lend you 100 million quid to build it, but who are you going to sell the power to, and, and what, um, what are my guaranteed revenue streams? So they will, they will say, right, well, I'm going to go and sell it to Centrica because Centrica's got an A minus credit rating, so they're a good credit risk, and I'm going to go and talk to Lee about it. Right, so they come and talk to us, and what they will, what we will offer them is. We will offer them a, 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 an indexed price to day ahead, so we will pay them a discount to the day ahead price. But then around that day ahead price, the day ahead price is currently 50 quid, we will put a floor price and a, and a cap, and we'll create what's called a collar. 
So we'll give them downside protection, so if the price drops below a certain level, we'll continue to pay them at that level. If the price goes above a certain level, we'll only pay them. And it's, it's a floor, it's attached to the, uh, to the, the head market, or is the floor absolute floor? No, the floor is an absolute floor. Absolute floor. Okay, and then the bank will lend off that floor, and then the other guaranteed revenue streams, that's revenue streams for renewable power stations, is the renewable obligation certificate, which is index linked, and the levy exam certificate. So if you, if the, I think Rock's currently, £43, roughly, 42 30 something like that, um, is, the, is the rock buyout price. If you're getting two rocks for every megawatt, you're going to be getting two times 42, which is 84. Your floor price might be £25, so that's 109 and then the bank will work out what debt it can lend against that. So, that, that, so they're the only real people we're seeing at the moment taking their head price risk. We did talk to one customer a while back about mm -hmm. taking their head price risk, but it seems to be something that customers don't want to do. And I can understand that because Downside's limited, <laughs> as you saw in that graph. You know, the, if you go if you go the wrong way, you know. I think it's quite a difficult conversation to have with the finance team if it goes the other way. Mm. So a lot of the time, the finance teams like to say, "This is roughly how much I'm going to spend on my energy budget." And um, yeah, I mean, you know, when you yeah. when you look at the, the volatility of, of what's happened with that time period. Yeah, I suppose you are a flexible contractor. Sorry, you, yeah. you do that for the customer and the customer yeah. just sees tranches of prices. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the company, the flexible company, we've got 24-7 flex. Yeah, I should know about that. That's my point being sold in the energy. We won't get into that. Um, the, that. That would allow you to, so you've got current flexible contracts laid by forward up to month ahead, is that right? Yeah. So you so you forward fix and then the 24-7 flex, so once you get within a month, you can still continue to buy power to fix out your price exposure up to gate closure, or four hours before gate closure, so within day. So in this, in this situation here, if you'd been buying forward and then you'd left a chunk open to day ahead, you would have, you would have lost out because the day ahead price was really high. However, in this situation, you probably would have made money because you'd have fixed out forward before the product dropped off. So it's, you know, it just depends on what your risk appetite is. You know, I suppose if I was doing it, I, I, I'd say if you're doing a film, I'm not going to give you any advice because I'm going to be prison with it. Um, I will. Um, the you know maybe you say like, I'll fix forward a bit, I'll fix in some in the long term, some in the medium term, and maybe I'll run some to to the prompt. But you're going to win sometimes, and you're going to lose sometimes. You're not going to win every time. If you're going to win every time, you want to go and get a job at Goldman Sachs <laughs> and trade it speculatively and make a lot more money than I did trading for Centrica. Any other questions? Seems to be a gloom and doom scenario where prices are going to continuously go up and buy a larger margin than we've been used to. Is that the way you see it over the next five, ten years? I think it's. I think that what we talked about is conflict. There's conflicting. It's conflicting evidence, isn't it? You know, um, power. The system is getting tighter. You know, the system is getting tighter. The system is getting tighter because loads and loads of coal kits. <coughs> Loads and loads of coal kits coming off. So all the must-run coal kits making all this margin on this black line is coming off, right? And, it, and, and we're not building any new gas-fired power stations to take up that slack because the market isn't showing that price signal. So because you, what, you, you wouldn't get anybody to invest in a CCGT right now with spark spreads that sits, basically suggest that for every megawatt you generate, you're going to lose money. So you know, if prices go up, if power prices were to go up in the future, and that spark spread was to widen. That would be a signal to build more CCGTs. So you build more CCGTs, and as soon as you build more CCGTs, you've got more enough. Then you've got more power on the system. The price could come. The price might come down. You know, and, and, and on power, as we said, a, a, a capacity mechanism. If they've got lots and lots and lots of um, plants sitting there in the capacity mechanism, power price could could be depressed because of that. So, you know, there are there are there are levers pulling up the price, and there's also levers pulling down the price. But don't forget, here we're only talking about the wholesale price, yeah. not, all of the, not all of the other bits that make up the bill, which are outside of my control and the UGP's control. Uh, on gas, it's all about how much shale gas comes out of the States, really, isn't it? So they're building lots of um, liquefaction plants right now um, in the States. Uh, but at, at present, we don't know how much the US government is going to allow to be exported. So I think there's, there's, two, there's two schools of thought. One is, one is, I think one is more Obama, which is 
we've shipped all our oil out and we have a problem, why don't we keep the gas for ourselves and make ourselves sufficient and, and underpin our own industry and all of that type of stuff. And then I think, is it Romney or Rimney? I can never remember. Rimney's a power station. Romney, is it? Or was Romney a power station? I can't remember. If he'd have got in, he's much more, you know, let the market decide, you know, and let the market decide, but basically, and then, um, oh, there it is. Uh, you know, with the price of, with the price of um, gas in the US, $4 of whatever MLB to you is for gas. Uh, you put it on your ship, you know, are you going to deliver it into Europe at 10? Probably not. But are you going to send it over to Japan and, 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 and the Far East? Then probably yes. So, you know, if, 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 the Ameri if, if America decides it's going to let a load of its um, shale gas go, then you could see downward pressure on gas prices going forward because of more supply. So hence it might not go up. But, you know, the other thing should be the, the, the opposite side of that argument is UK continental shelf, shelf gas uh, reserves are, are falling. So it's a, I, say, I can't give you any advice, I don't know. Um, so it, it, could go on, it could go either way. But I think if you buy the poor you can have some stick, isn't it? I haven't seen it for a while. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Does that manage to answer your question without giving you any advice whatsoever? Absolutely. Excellent. Have you got your Saks address? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're trade commodities anymore, but the banks, have been out, the banks have been pulling out physical commodities um, because of the increased regulation. Excellent. I'm just very conscious of uh, your time, but thank you ever so much, Lee. That was brilliant.